today we want to talk about reappearance, the reappearance, inshallah, of the Imam. However, just uh, one more sign of reappearance we uh, discuss, and then something about these signs. Of course, at the beginning when we were trying to proceed to discuss the signs, I mentioned a few things about the whole idea of signs of reappearance. There's one more thing to discuss at the end and then inshallah we'll discuss the idea of or the way the reappearance would happen. Uh, some other signs, the creation of a Muslim state in the East, Fel Mashraq. Now this Fel Mashraq of course uh, uh, is very vague because whatever is on the eastern side of Medina or Mecca or Iraq is called the East. So where in the East? But uh, there are certain guesses that this East, usually Mashraq was Khurasan and parts of Iran were called East at that time. So of course they, they had no idea of going as far as China or for example Indonesia to talk about the East. The East meant uh, Persia, Khorasan, these areas were the East. So another sign is creation of a Muslim state in the East as we had creation of a Muslim state in Syria led by Sufyani, creation of a Muslim state in Yemen led by Yemani. Now this Muslim state in the East is led by uh, Ar Rajul al Khorasani. Now a man from Khorasan, so it's quite clear where the East uh, I mean, if we accept Rajul al-Khurasani, it's, it's clear where the East is. Yakhruju Nasun, this is a Sunni source, of course, Kanzul Umal is a very famous Sunni source. Reporting from the prophets is Kanzul Umal, sorry, I have misprinted Kanzul Maal, it's Kanzul Umal. Yakhruju Nasul Mashriq, Fayuwattuuna Sultana. The people of the East will rise and will pave the way for his sovereignty. Now this is of course a part of tradition chosen by uh, al muttaq al-Hindi and uh, uh, brought in the chapter about the reappearance of Mahdi saying that of course when he wants to come there should be some preparations. He should have supports and this support should come from organized armies and states. It cannot come from individuals, therefore there is need for some states to be somehow loyal to the call of the Imam when he appears. And one of the most important thing is this state in the East, which would uh, pave the way for his sovereignty. And there is another hadith from Imam al-Baghir alayhi salam, Ka'anni biqawmin qad kharaju bil mashriq. It is as if I am looking at a people, that means with my, of course, spiritual knowledge, who rise from the East, they demand the haqq, but it is not granted to them. Then they demand it repeatedly, but they are not given what they ask for. When they see this, they wear their swords, then they are offered what they want, but they don't accept. That means there will be some sort of conciliation, okay, what do you want, we give you, the final, of course, word is no, we don't want you, we don't want you to be there to give us anything, you have to go, so they would not accept, before they rise and win the power, and they would not submit it to anyone but the Sahib Al-Amr, those of them who would be killed are martyrs, should I see their time, I would sacrifice my life, for the Qa'i, mean, meaning that I would be among these people who stand up, take the power, make a state and prepare the way for the Qa'i and therefore their state is a state that if anyone is killed for it would become a martyr and I wish I would have become one of those martyrs. This is what is mentioned from Imam al-Baghir about this state in the East. The state will come in the East. Now, the tradition would not elaborate on what, who these people are. And since the old times, people have made speculations about this state in the East. What is it? And whenever a state is created in the East, 
like the Safavid, for example, era, they said, yes, this is paving the way for uh, Sahib al Am to come. So they have made guesses. Abu Muslim of Khurasan, well, he, this Rajul came from Khurasan, this was the man who paved the way for the, uh, the, the Abbasids. And if it was not because of him, the Abbasid wouldn't have uh, defeated the Umayyads. And very interestingly, this man came with black banners as we have in many traditions, that people who are in this Eastern state, they come forward with black banners. Uh, however, of course, uh, uh, probably this hope was something made by the Abbasid themselves, to say that we are the ones who are preparing the way for Mahdi. And we discussed that how they tried to uh, somehow justify the rule of some of their caliphs by claiming that he is the Mahdi. Uh, especially the Mahdi son of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. Now, the second speculation, the Safavids. Uh, well, we might say, well, at that time, when the Safavids ruled for about 150 years, so when they created their estate, they hoped that this is the state which we are going to hand to Mahdi salam, and this is the state coming from the east which we have in our reports. However, it did not happen. Now, some people may say that when it says they paved the way for Mahdi, it doesn't mean that their government would last until the time of Mahdi salam. They paved the way for him. And the Safavids, we can say, they, yes, they paved the way by creating a Shiite state. They might have done so. They might have done, uh, paved the way for, for Mahdi to come. However, the traditions say that they would not pass on this power to anyone but to Mahdi, which, of course, is something uh, did not have, which did not happen about the Safavids. The third speculation, which is uh, sometimes heard, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Of course, we hope that it is, but it might turn out not to be. We have to wait and see uh, whether this is the state which is going to be connected to the, uh, to the state of Mahdi salam or not. This we have to see in the history. Now, the supporters of the latter view resort to other traditions, like a tradition from Imam al qadim This is a very famous tradition about, about Qom. In the books of, about the history of Qom, you would see this tradition very much, and other traditions about a time when people from the Qom would pave the way uh, for the reappearance of Mahdi. السلام, the hadith which is in Bahar al-Anwar says Rajulun min ahli qum yad'u nasa ila al-haq A man from qum will rise and will call people to haq A people who are like pieces of iron will gather around him The stormy winds will not shake them Neither they will get tired of battles No, they will fear Their reliance will be on God and the good end belongs to the God-fearing. Now, of course, this tradition doesn't say anything about Mahdi salam, And that this, these people would rely on God and take the power and then hand it to Mahdi. But uh, some people have connected these, have related this to the previous hadith, saying that, yes, okay, that state which is going to be created in the East might be the Islamic Republic of Iran, and the man from the Qom is, of course, Ayatollah Khomeini coming, and uh, they handed it to Rajul al Khurasani, a man from Khurasan, and then uh, uh, the other things. But these type of speculations have always been there in history. Since the traditions are vague, since they are not very clear, which of course they should be, like that, not very clear, therefore speculations cannot uh, uh, have much value here. We have to really wait and see, and if we do not live long, inshallah, in Barzakh, Allah will give us uh, permission to see, because usually people in Barzakh are unaware of what's going on in this world, but uh, as we are unaware of what's going on in that world, they are unaware of what's going on in this world, but sometimes there is a permission to see what's happening, and we pray that Allah would, uh, would give us that uh, power to see what will happen, at least to resolve some of our intellectual 
problems that we have about Mahdi السلام, when he comes. Now, question. Now I want you to answer this question. Are the signs a point of hope or disappointment? Any answer? Yes. It's neither. Why? So what's the, po- what's the point of all these signs? Okay, you are just returning my question to myself. Good. Very clever. <laughs> Any other answer? Hope. Hope. Now, hope, yes, of course, at times when something happens which might be uh, somehow uh, a case for those signs. Like, for example, we say a, a, a state in the East would be created which will be which will pave the way for coming of Mahdi alayhi salam. Then we say now yes we have a state in the east, therefore it's quite close. But sometimes these signs seem to be very far fetched. Like for example Sofiani making a coup in Syria, taking Iraq, taking Jordan, taking Palestine. When is this going to be? This is certainly not going to be in our lifetime. Of course, the, the world is, uh, especially the world of politics and power is quite uh, unpredictable, but uh, usually many of these signs seem to be very far. And therefore, we might think that, okay, this is not going to happen soon, if these signs. So, at times it might, it might give us hope, especially in times when something close to those signs happen and we say, yes, this is the sign, it's good, Imam is coming, but usually these signs are somehow deterrents. We think that before these things happen, Imam will not come, these things have not taken place, and therefore Imam will not come. However, a good thing about these signs, you remember we said that these signs are of two kinds, mahtum and mawqoof. The uh, definitive signs and conditional signs, things which would take place definitely and things which take place conditional of some other events. Uh, contingent, so to speak, signs. However, even about this definitive signs, we are told that don't worry about it very much. Because even for the definitive signs, the bada might take place. And it might not happen. Suddenly, Imam may come tomorrow. We don't know. So, we don't need to wait for these signs to come about so that Imam comes. Many of these signs have already taken place, but it's not the case that necessarily, necessarily, even the traditions we had that Mahdi will not come before Sufyani, if Sufyani is not there, Mahdi will not be there. Now, look at this tradition. I don't know how authentic the tradition is. It is uh, uh, in Ghaybatun Nu'mani, Abu Hashim Dawud ibn Qasim al-Ja'fari. Al-Ja'fari because he is a, a grand-grand-grandson of uh, Ja'far al-Tayyar. A very, very prominent uh, uh, reporter from A'imma alayhi musalam. And he lived until the time of Imam, uh, the 12th Imam. Uh, a very prominent member of the uh, family of the Prophet. Dawud ibn Qasim al-Ja'fari, Abu Hashim. He says that uh, we were around Imam al-Jawad and a mention of Sufyani was made and that his advent will be definitive. مَا جَعَ فِي الرَّوَايَ مِنْ أَنَّ أَمْرَهُ مِنَ الْمَحْتُومِ So we were discussing in the presence of Imam al-Jawad that yes, in the traditions we have that Sufyani is definitive, it's a definitive sign. فَقُلْتُ لَعْبِي جَعْفَارِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ حَلْ يَبْدُوا لِلَّهِ فِي الْمَحْتُومِ Then I asked Imam Jawad alayhi salam, is it possible that even in these definitive signs, bada might take place? You know what bada is. Bada is uh, uh, 
a change of decision, so to speak. Of course, Allah does not change his decision, but a change of what has been informed about the decision of God, which for certain reasons a change would take place. This is a very, very important concept in the Shi'i faith, which are always criticized because of it by other Sunni scholars, of course they don't know that the Quran says وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ The Jews say the hands of Allah are tied because when he makes a decision and he informs then there is no change غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا May their hands be tied, Allah's hands are open. He informs you about something, you do things, things might change. It depends all the time. Because of the course of events which are made by your decisions. Therefore, Bada is not change of decision of by God, but there are many, many decrees of God which would take place conditional of certain events or certain decisions by us. And therefore we may be informed that such and such would take place. And why we are informed? Because the level of knowledge of Aimma and Prophet reaches only to that level, to that station of knowledge. It cannot go beyond it. So they inform whatever appears to them. However, Allah might make other things appear. This is, this is the meaning of bada, bada to them. And then we think there is a change of decision for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah's hands are never tight. So, here... Uh, Abu Hashim asked Imam al-Jahad about this very concept. We know about Bada in, in our faith. You have informed us, you have told us that there is Bada in Allah's decisions as it appeared to us. Is it possible that this Bada happened about Sufyani as well? That even Sufyani would not come and Imam comes before him? He said yes, it's possible. We said then we fear that Bada may happen in Qa'im as well. Now we are promised that Mahdi will come. What if Bada includes it and then Mahdi does not come? Then all our hopes and whatever we are saying, whatever we are preaching is in vain. Now it's a very very deep and wise answer. He said Al-Qa'im is a promise. And Allah will never break his promise. Bada never happens about a promise. It happens about things which prophets are informed about, then a change comes because of the change in position of the people. In Allah, this taghir change uh, is something which happens in Allah's decrees. Because people change, we change. We change our decision about them. And however, we do not change promise. We never change promise. So, Mahdi is a promise of God, but Sufyani is not a promise. Sufyani is a sign of coming of Mahdi, and therefore, yeah, Bada may include it. Now, just off the course of these lectures, another question will come, you know, about all these promises that Allah gives in the Quran that he would take the wrongdoers to hell. There is a discussion between theologians and Muslim scholars whether Allah can break this promise or cannot break this promise. He promises Allah. this is the promise of God. He will take any wrongdoer to hell, any evil person to hell. But what if on the day of judgment he says, okay, I, I don't take you to hell, go to paradise. Can he do it or he cannot do it? The Ash'ari say he cannot do it. It's impossible. The Mu'taz- no, sorry, the Mu'tazilah say it's impossible. It's, there are very rational people, Mu'tazilah. It's impossible. When Allah promises something should go to hell, they should go to hell. The Shi'as and the Ash'ari say, no, Allah may break this promise. So, uh, is there anything wrong here? Here, Imam says, Allah la mi'ad. And there, we have this idea that, yes, Allah, of course, has promised to take everyone, every evil wrongdoer to hell, but he might, he might add that 
end of the day, because he's very merciful, his heart is very soft, so to speak, then he might see these people are going to burn in hell. He said, no, 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 okay, I change my mind, go to, go to paradise. I, I want to destroy the hell altogether, for example. Is it possible? Well, the Shia say it is. Now, you Shias say this, it is possible, so tell me why. Yes. So there's a different level of problems, just like a different level of No, it's not anything to do with Bada. you see? Not that it's a level of knowledge. The prophets are informed, yes, I may not take them to hell at the end of the day. It's possible. And we hope, we hope so. We hope this, this happens, inshallah. Of course, not for some people. <laughs> but uh, for most people, we hope this happens. So, any other answer? Mercy. Yeah. So that, that is just what, in, in our limited terms, defines the last one. So within that, there is no consist- inconsistency. Yeah. Quite acceptable for that. Really yeah. To that's right. Yeah, that's true. Actually, promise should be kept if it is in your favor, isn't it? If I promise you that, for example, you do this and I give you such and such, if I don't keep it, it's wrong, it's unethical. But if I promise that I tell you, I tell you, I swear, that if you do this, I will punish you. And you do it, I have promised. Is it ethically wrong to break this promise? Or good? It's good, isn't it? It's ethically good. It's not wrong. If I am a real, honorable gentleman, everyone would expect from me that I do not speak or keep the promise and be generous. Now, this is exactly the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not take anyone to hell unless, unless there is no other choice. Otherwise, now we have this verse in the Quran, وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا Anyone killing a mu'min purposefully, intentionally, فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ The punishment is the hell. وَغَذِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah will become very angry with him. وَغَذِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ And will curse him. Then Imam, uh, uh, because this was a understanding about Shias, that this is the case, Allah may not, may not punish. Then the Imam was asked, what about this verse? He says, فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَلِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah will have wrath on them and curse them. Imam said, yes, جَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ اَنْ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ اَنْ يُعَذَّمْ If Allah wants to punish, his punishment is hell. But what if he doesn't want to punish? It depends. It depends on different situations. Some hopes, anyhow. It gives us some hope that... Uh, Allah is even more merciful than we think. Now, okay, therefore, regarding the signs, nothing is said. Imam might come tomorrow without a state in Syria, without a state in Yemen, without Sufiani, without whatever, he might come tomorrow. And we don't know, maybe all these signs should be fulfilled before he comes. Therefore, These signs are really not a very important thing that we have to worry about or be concerned about, not worried about, concerned about. Okay, now let's talk about reappearance, the reappearance. How does the Imam come about? Of course, this is one of the most complicated and difficult uh, literature of Hadith because there are lots of contradictions, uh, uh, different... uh, Uh, time scales and these things which is really really difficult to uh, sketch a sort of uh, uh, orderly and uh, uh, chronological course of event for the coming of the Imam. So what is uh, uh, discussed here, what I will Uh, discuss here as the course of events of coming of the Imam is based on the book of the era of reappearance by Sheikh Ali Qurani. Of course, even that book 
because the traditions are so much different with each other, contradicting each other. Even in that book you find those contradictions. However, I've simplified it. This is an imaginable course of events when Imam reappears, how it happens. However, as I said, it's not quite certain. It's not possible to draw, uh, to, or to, to to, to work out one real course of events because of these contradictions in traditions. And uh, therefore, uh, this is, as I said, an imaginable course of events. Something which may be the way the things would develop when Imam uh, is permitted to reappear and come back to the people. Now, Mahdi salam, now this is for certain, reappears in a circle of 313 companions who gather round him when he declares his mission in Mecca. He declares his mission in Mecca. Uh, or before that. Now, why before that? Because of uh, things which I mentioned later on. However, these 313, according to traditions, are of a wide range of nationalities and 50 of them are women. I don't know why they want to do what they want to do in the government of Mahdi alayhi salam, but now it's a fashion to have ladies as prime ministers and uh, deputy prime ministers, deputy presidents. Uh, so, because these 313 are the core of the Imam's government, they are not just companions like others, they are the core of Mahdi's companions. And having 50 women among these 313 is. Uh, Amazing, isn't it? Uh, however, his reappearance has two stages, which we call the minor reappearance and the major reappearance. So, as we had minor occultation and major occultation, we will have, inshallah, minor reappearance and major reappearance. Now, exactly the same definition as we had about minor and major occultation. Minor reappearance is when the Imam appears only to these 313 or even to a closer circle. He sends these emissaries round saying that the Imam has appeared or reappeared. However, no one sees him. No one knows where he is. He is in his hideout because it is not possible for him to immediately come out and say, I am Mahdi, immediately he will be killed. So he is not going to have, unless on very, very exceptional occasions, he is not going to have miracles or extraordinary power to, uh, to win the battle or war. It's just ordinary organizational power that he is going to organize. Of course, when we say not extraordinary power, the same way as we say about the Prophet, peace be on him. He had extraordinary power, he had this uh, support from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it didn't come like, for example, he's standing in front of the army and say, be dead, and everyone get, be killed. No, it's not like that. He had to have an army, he had to fight, he had to have battles, he had to have support, and all these things would be about Mahdi alayhi salam, so it's a very, very difficult path for Mahdi salam to start from scratch, of course with these 313, and then to mobilize people, attract attentions, mobilizing an army, making alliances with the government in the east, with the government in Yemen, making alliances, and then uh, advancing uh, to take control. So. The minor reappearance happens after the coup of Sufyan in Syria, as the traditions put it, in Rajab. Followed by the Seha in Ramadan, we said that there will be, there will be a Seha, that's the cry, that talks about Mahdi is coming, beware Mahdi is coming, or something like that, which we do not know what it would be look like. What is it looking like? Uh, however, this happens. Why I have brought Rajab? Because the whole minor reappearance would take 
only six months and then there will be the major reappearance that is the uh, the coming of the Imam to the open public and declaration of his mission so if it happens in Rajab then the Imam should come in Muharram uh, as we have in many many different traditions that he will reappear openly in Muharram but in Rajab when the coup is, takes place by Sufyani in Syria and takes power and creates that very rigid Muslim state there which is against all sort of flexibilities uh, then Imam reappears to some of these companions now how these companions are informed how they become aware probably because such pious people which as soon as the uh, the message of the Imam is uh, has reached them by those very close uh, clients of the Imam we said Imam lives among some clients then they will uh, they will accept they come to the Imam and from his hideout the Imam starts sending these people to scholars to heads of states to others saying that Mahdi has come in the in this period which lasts for six months on months until Muharram the Imam does not appear to all but will gradually recruit the 313 and will send his emissaries to different heads of states scholars prominent people from his hideout in Medina now right from the beginning we said that Imam lived in Medina uh, and when he is going to come again he comes from Medina therefore probably his real and uh, permanent residence during all these times is Medina that he is going to come from Medina as well since the mission of the emissaries come after Sufyani and Seha so they are not to be belied isn't it because in traditions we had that anyone coming and telling that they have a mission from the Imam before Seha and Sufyani they are lawyers but now they are not lawyers because Sufyani has come Seha has come and therefore the good people scholars prominent pious people they accept that Imam has come and they are waiting now okay Imam has come what should we do we want to come and see him no wait it's not the time wait just have in mind that Imam has come wait for the orders wait for the right time and in this way the word spreads and this is what makes Sufyani very angry of course that Mahdi has come this is what makes the government in Hejaz very concerned that Mahdi has come the news would go round and therefore people would think that yeah there are very extremist people who are talking about Mahdi and we have to uproot them these are very dangerous people because what what's the meaning of Mahdi What's the concept of Mahdi to destroy the injustice and iniquity so these are revolutionary people so the, this polarization would take place of course the West is not aware of this yet this is now going in the Muslim world now yeah, this is the hadith which we mentioned before ala faman idda al mushahada qabla khuruj sufyani was sayha fa huwa kadhibun muftar beware whoever claims seeing me before the advent of sufyani and the sayha he is a liar so if these people come after sufyani and sayha they are not liars anymore and people should believe them two states respond positively to the imam iran under Sayyid, Sayyid Khurasani, because this is Persian, I have omitted Al, and Yemen under Al Yamani. They believe that yes, this has happened. And they wait. They wait for the orders, they wait for the right time. However, they cannot do anything at the moment. And we will see that even later on, they cannot do anything until the Imam himself makes the alliance. Two states would actively reject him. Sufyani in Syria and the government in Hejaz as I said this is now inside the Muslim world we are not talking about uh, the world outside 
rejects him, Sufyan in Syria and the government in Hejaz, this will create bitter acrimony among Muslims. Now the polarization will happen. A group of Muslims believe that Mahdi has come, and you know how quick these news would spread at a time of internet and TV and radio, and we don't know at what that time what will come. So how quickly these news would spread, and how quickly the society becomes polarized, and therefore the Muslim world becomes into two pieces. One piece, who are mostly Shias, believe in Mahdi, in the reappearance of Mahdi, and the other in Hejaz and in Syria. They are against it, and therefore they try to find this man who claims to be Mahdi, but no one knows where he is. They try to find him and kill him. By this time, the whole world knows about this dispute. When disputes, when polarization comes, yes. People will be polarized, but the people in Yemen are not Shia, they're Sunni. Most of them are Zaydis. However, uh, even among Sunnis, because the idea of Mahdi is there among Sunnis as well. But for the most part of the Sunni world, this is not accepted. For the most part of the Shia world, this is accepted, that the Mahdi has come. Until he comes and openly uh, creates his own state, then the Sunni world would realize and then things would change. But at the moment it is like that. Yamani and Khorasani. Now, when this polarization happens in the Muslim world, then the whole world knows about it. That's, yes, the Muslim world is now into two pieces, they are fighting. Good opportunity for the British, of course. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it's too late now. Of course, at that time it's too late for the British to do anything. But they think that this is now a good opportunity, divide and rule, go. This dispute in the Muslim world is known and about the reappearance. And more people succeed to meet him and pay allegiance to him gradually. Some people are taken to him, who are very, very confident and uh, trustworthy. They are taken to him, they pay allegiance, they go to their cities and they say, wait, wait. Now we might say to the Imam, we have waited this long, again we have to wait, you have now come, again we have to wait. Yes, wait, patience, as sabru Rasul Iman, patience is the head of faith. In this quarrel now, of course, the West cannot stay indifferent. Of course, Sofiani and his army are supported by the West because these are revolutionaries. These are people who are talking about end of the world and these things. Now, it's, it's quite natural that the West would support Sofiani and his army. However, nothing has happened yet. The state in Hejaz is busy with the wrangling of its royal family at the time. Now, we have many traditions about this, that when Imam reappears in Medina, when he's in his hideout, there is lots of uh, uh, quarrel uh, inside the royal family who's ruling the Hejaz. According to the tradition, this happens after the death of a king by the name of Abdullah. Ah. <laughs> don't raise hopes. There are thousands of Abdullahs. We don't. Uh, and Abi Basir, this is in Bahar al Nwar, Qala Sametu Abu Abdullah alayhi salam yakul, Man yadmunu li mawt Abdullah, adhmunu lahu al qa'im. Well, I have brought the translation of this, sorry. Whoever guarantees for me the death of Abdullah, I guarantee the reappearance of the qa'im for them. Then he said, uh, when Abdullah dies, people after him would not follow one ruler. There will be arguments inside their old family. And these quarrels and disputes for power would not end in Hejaz until the Qa'im will come, inshallah. And the kingdoms which lasted for years suddenly turn into months and even days. Someone becomes the king, he's killed next week, someone else becomes the king, he's killed after 15 days, and this is what will happen in Hejaz. 
until the ra'im will come. Now, this is one of the most important prerequisites for the Imam to be able to declare his mission in Hejaz. Otherwise, if there is a powerful central government, he would be killed immediately. So, this is the time actually the Imam is waiting for this time in Hejaz, that the central government is weak, he can come out in Masjid al-Haram and declare his mission. He, furthermore, being worried about the situation in Hejaz, sorry, what happened? Uh, Sofiani, being worried about losing the unstable Iraq to Iran, and the hegemony of Mahdi will attack and occupy Iraq because now Iran is the pole which supports the Mahdi and Iraq is in between. Some people follow the course of Mahdi, some people are opposed and therefore Sufyani is worried that Iran's hegemony might extend to Iraq and the Mahdi's idea would extend there so he preempts the Iranians and attacks Iraq and occupies that place. He furthermore, now all these are traditions, it is not something made up. However, as I said, it's very difficult to get this one straight line uh, from traditions as they are very, very complicated literature. He furthermore being worried about the situation in Hejaz, and seeing the weakness of the state there will send an army to attack Medina and to find Mahdi. Now, you can't do it, I do it. This man has created this big turmoil in the Muslim world. He claims to be Mahdi. We know that people say he is in Medina, so I want to find him. He will have anyone by the name of Muhammad ibn al-Hassan killed in Medina. Now, this is very strange. It's, uh, he wants to make sure like Pharaoh killing every uh, newborn child in Banu Islam to make sure that Isa, uh, Musa alayhi salam is not born. He wants to make sure that no Muhammad ibn Hassan will be left in Medina. Of course, it's very easy because the identity cards and all these things. Therefore, many of Sadat will be killed in this attack in Medina. Now, still the Imam is in his hideout. The Imam flees Medina with a couple of his companions and resides in a mountain near Mecca as a Zitoa. And Radwa and Zitoa and Ghairaha, don't we have this? The, the mountain near Radwa, near Medina, uh, Zitoa near Mecca. Probably a mountain called Zitoa. He will reside there. So you can see how tense the situation is that even the rumors or the news of Imam coming has created such a uh, tense and military type of uh, uh, society and environment for the Imam. The Imam sends Nafsu Zakiya as his emissary to Mecca to tell to people that Imam has come and he is going to come to you soon, but he will be killed in Masjid al-Haram this happens towards the end of Dhul Hajjah. His mother will meet vast international coverage and condemnation because he has done nothing, just people in Masjid al Haram while he's praying or something, just come to him, kill him in the mosque, and this, of course, attracts condemnation in the Muslim world and worldwide. Now, it's bad that Nafsu Zakiya is killed, but it's good in the sense that now all attentions are drawn to the fact that, yes, there is something happening. This idea of Mahdi, everyone knows Mahdi and uh, the tension which is created because of that in the Muslim world. The Imam will ask all his companions to secretly enter Mecca. These are those 330. He calls them from all around the world, to whom well he has sent him them. And on the 9th of Muharram he will enter Masjid al-Haram and declares himself 
as the Mahdi. This is two weeks after Nafsu Zakiya is killed in Masjid al Haram. Initially, some people and the security in the mosque moved to kill him. But the 313 who are all present, and some of them don't know each other, protect him because these are the people who are all around the world. They have come to Masjid al Haram by the message of Imam Mahdi, salam. even they don't know each other. But as they, know all, they, they all know Mahdi, but they don't know each other. So as soon as people try to attack Mahdi salam, like what they did to Nafsu Zakiya, and especially the security, they stand up, they put up a protection or a, a, a sort of protection shield around the Imam. His followers around the world feel, will feel scared and weep and cry because they think he will be arrested and killed. This was not the way they expected. Because now Imam was in hideout, all these troubles were going on, Sufyani was after him, uh, in, other, in Hejaz also people were after him. Now he comes suddenly to Masjid al and declares his uh, mission, so they all get really, really concerned and worried. However, he will be responded positively in Mecca. Amazingly. And due to the virtually non-existence of a central power in Hejaz, he will easily manage to take Mecca without violence. It's very important because all through this uh, uh, struggle to establish a state, Imam does not use violence. So without violence, Mecca falls in his hand because we don't have a central power. Now people who are living in Mecca, many of them, even many Hujaj, they, they respond to Mahdi. And the 330 people, very clever, especially the 50 women, they are very clever. And they manage to establish that power in Mecca. The next day, on the day of Ashura, he will make a public announcement which is broadcasted worldwide. And of course in traditions we have different statements. What this statement is? What does he say? What is he going to say? Of course this is very very important. This is going to be very very important. Because the whole world's attention is already drawn to this dispute among Muslims and now he wants to make the declaration he is the Mahdi who was in hideout now he has come out he wants to make a public declaration because uh, of course the traditions are somehow uh, not conforming with each other and we really don't know what he is going to say this statement is going to be very very important because this is the first impact that he is going to make on the world he is addressing not only Muslims, he is addressing Christians, Jews, Buddhists, all the people around the world would hear him. So we don't know how is he going to address the people. That's going to be very important. Of course he talks, he will talk about justice, he will talk about humane behavior, he will talk about God, which is forgotten in the West, and these are the things that uh, uh, are elements included in these different traditions about his khutbah on that first broadcast, worldwide broadcast. His followers increase in Mecca and he succeeds to defeat an army sent by Sufyani to arrest him. Now of course they thought these, these are just a bunch of people, very small. An army is sent by Sufyani because in Hejaz there is no central power to command and therefore an army is sent by Sufyani from Iraq and they managed to defeat that army. Now the danger has of course increased. Supported by the West, Sofiani will mobilize a huge army and moves towards Mecca to arrest the Imam. Now this is the crucial moment that Imam needs help, isn't it? Now there are, how many are they? Now this army is tremendous army with the most sophisticated weaponry. They move to remove the Imam and to arrest him and this is the crucial moment when the Khas takes place that's sinking into the earth. The whole army of Sufyani will sink 
into the earth. And this is actually a miracle for the Imam which convinced many hearts in the Muslim world and outside the Muslim world that this man is someone special. This is not an ordinary person. So again, here Imam does not use any violence. It's Allah who uses his own violence or the earth who is using his violence taking, dragging the Sufiani and whole his army into the earth. He, however, in the most crucial and decisive moment of this whole event, will sing in the earth with all his army in Bayda, al khasfu bil Bayda, you remember. Some sources, however, put the mobilization of Sufiani after the Imam is established in Iraq. Now, this is a long time, so I, this is why I say the uh, traditions do not tally with each other, so we have to make an imaginable uh, course of events. The shocking news of this event works in favor of the Imam. And with an army of 10,000, the Imam moves out to take Medina and end the persecution of his followers there. Because the situation in Medina is horrific for the Shias, for the followers of Mahdi. So he moves to take Medina. This is called the Khuruj of the Imam. As his first declaration in Mecca is called his Zuhur appearance. Because traditions talk about the Zuhur and the Khuruj of the Imam. Now, him coming out in Masjid al-Haram, declaring himself as Imam, is not Khuruj. It's Zuhur, it's reappearance. The Khuruj is when he moves out of Mecca to take Medina. The following hadith is a witness to this terminology. Abdul Azim al Hassani, you know, all you know him, buried in South Tehran. Qultu li Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Musa. Sorry, I have not translated this tradition in English, I just translated now. He says that I told to Imam Jawad alayhi salam, uh, I hope, inni la arju an takun al qa'im min ahli bayt Muhammad. I hope that you are the qa'im. Because he was very young at that time. He came after Imam al Rida. He was a point of hope. I hope you will be the Ghaim of the Ahlul Bayt who will fill the earth with justice and equity after it's filled with oppression and inequality. He said, Ya Bal Qasim, Ma minna illa qa'amun bi amrillah. Of course, all of us are Ghaim bi amrillah. We, we rise, whatever we do is by the command of God and we guide to his faith. However, I am not that Qa'im which Allah will purify the earth in, by him in his hands. His companions whose number are the same as the number of the, uh, uh, of the army of Badr 313 men will come round him from farthest parts of the earth. So that's why in traditions we have that these people are from many, many different nationalities. As wide as Europe, even we have uh, probably more than 50 of them being from Europe and uh, from Africa from northeast, uh, from far east, uh, like Indonesia, China, these will come together. And then, after this number has come together, Imam Adhara Amrah would make appear his affairs. Whenever the number of his army is completed, and that is 10,000, then he, advi- he, he advances, he comes out. Kharaja. So here we have talked of the Zuhur and talked of Khuruj of the Imam, and Khuruj is when he moves out of Mecca to take Medina. The above hadith mentions that 313 will come to him from the farthest places, and when this number is compat- complete, he will appear. And when 10,000 gather around him, he will advance 
there's a difference between appearance and advent. As soon as the Hijaz is taken by the Imam, Iran, Iraq, and Yemen put themselves under his command and submit their sovereignty to him. Now, you might say, why, when Sufyani was moving, these states did not start to do anything? Well, because of the politics, global politics. Now, why, for example, Muslim states who are now supporting Palestine cannot attack Israel or cannot do anything about many other things which, is, which are happening because of the global politics. It's the balance of power. I mean, as soon as, for example, say Yemen or Iran started to move towards Iraq, of course that was uh, an act of aggression and then the allies would have come. So it is a very complicated world. Therefore, they could not have done anything until the Imam establishes himself in Hejaz and then they submit their sovereignty to the Imam. And then they become one big alliance. Now, when they become one big alliance, of course, this is very dangerous. This is now a big power. It's not just a man in Mecca or in Hejaz. This is now a big power. So, as soon as the Hejaz is taken by the Imam Iran, Iraq and Yemen put themselves under his command and submit their sovereignty to him, although there will be oppositions in Iraq still. Iraq is a marshland. The establishment of Saudi, such huge Muslim states would whistle the alarm in both the West and the East. And the tremendous propaganda machine in both directions start their machinations. These are terrorists, and these are such and such, they kill, they do not respect human rights or whatever. Well, we know what they say. Don't worry about this. When the Imam comes, don't think that your Imam is like that. It's just media machinations. So, that is why the people of the West and the people of the East, this is what exactly we have in the tradition, start hating Mahdi and cursing him. Now, how he is portrayed, we don't know. How he is going to, portray, to be portrayed in the media in the West, we don't know. But you know this media can do whatever they want. They have brought about several revolutions in different countries just by the portrayal that they make of the events. And now they can portray, maybe they, they just say he is a magician, look at this Khas in Beida, the army of Sofiani, all those innocent people being killed by his magic, or, we don't know what they say. But this is what starts to happen. The people start in the West and in the East. Now, the West, of course we know where the West is, Europe, America, then China in the East, China, Japan, all those other countries, they start to have a very bad image of uh, Mahdi alayhi salam. A battle will take place between the forces of the Imam and the Western fleet in the Persian Gulf. Why? Because of all these sort of propaganda, which results in the latter's defeat. So, the Western fleet in the Persian Gulf is defeated and they go. Now, this adds to the propaganda now. That's, now, this man has come to take the world. This is a brutal Muslim leader who has no regard for blood, no regard for souls, no regard for life, for human rights. He wants to take us back to the dark ages, to where and when people were worshipping God and all these things. So, this propaganda starts to uh, increase. The Imam will choose Kufa as the seat of his government and many believers would move and settle there. Because now the Imam is there, they want to live beside Imam, so the Kufa will become a huge city. A big Islamic metropole the Kufa will become. After establishing himself in Iraq, the Imam will send his army to three Al-Quds. Now, this is the most dangerous mission of the Imam, of course, to free al Quds. We don't know who, who has the Quds at that time, but certainly the Jews are very strong there. And uh, they would start, they would put up a very, very fierce uh, defense against the Imam. The Western powers will move their forces to land 
in Turkey to thwart the Imam. So, again, we see how these, of course, it's very complicated. I have made it very simple here. The traditions are very complicated. How these forces come, how they move, where they land, where they start to somehow uh, establish their armies. And uh, therefore now, this great danger of clash of civilizations come. Now, the Muslim civilization, the big chunk of the Muslim civilization is now in complete uh, uh, standoff with the West. On their way, now, Imam wouldn't move to Al-Quds himself, he sends his army. Now, something very interesting happens here. On their way, the Imam's companions show a miracle, which makes the West hesitant of confrontation. From a cave in Antioch, they would bring out the holy chest in which original copies of the Torah and the Angel are kept. And this, just like electricity moves on Western media, they claim that yes, the original copies of Torah and Angel have been found, and then they are recited, they are argued about, discussed, and these things. And now West becomes a bit hesitant to confront this man who has shown this, this very important miracle of bringing the holy chest. And, uh, the Imam will therefore enter the courts without any confrontation from the West. Now the West pulls out. The Imam enters the Quds. And this is the very crucial moment. The very crucial moment. It is probably in Al-Quds where Isa will descend and will bear witness for Mahdi. Now, this, is, this is what was the main problem, the West and Islam. Now, Isa will descend, bear witness for Mahdi. His testimony is of tremendous importance for convincing the, convincing the people in the West. Very, very important. Now, of course, he has to convince the people that he's Jesus. He has to convince the people that he's truthful. And certainly, he knows how to speak. And this, of course, softens the hearts of the Christian world. According to some traditions, the following verse in Surah Ali Imran alludes to this event. Now, I stop here, because now we have some discussions here. And we take questions and answers, and inshallah we'll continue with this next week. Tuesday, isn't it? Next Tuesday, inshallah. Thank you much, indeed, Sheikh. Uh, so it seems that Iran is becoming a central place now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they talk about this Iran, we don't know. Maybe something in future. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope it's this Iran. Hmm? <laughs> let's hope it's this yes. Iran. Okay, brothers, sisters, any sisters want to start off with the kick off with a question? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, um, you talked about the warfare. It's mostly like um, what sort of weapons will be used, and um, why, if they were sophisticated weapons, why would they not bomb like they do nowadays? They bomb a place before they go in. Um, yeah, they use bombs, but now, of course, they don't want to bomb cities and these things, certainly. They have to... Is it because it's Makkah and they don't want to um, Masjid al-Haram? Even nowadays, in, in battles and wars, they just don't bomb the cities. They start, they, they try to make a fight with the armies rather than the cities. Therefore, at that time as well, of course, this is not a wise thing to bomb Makkah. And how they can make sure by bombing Makkah they would kill him up. So, it's not possible. We have, in some traditions, we have a huge fire appearing in the sky. And this might allude to an atomic bomb or something, which falls in some Islamic land. However, the, the traditions are so vague that you really cannot guess. But they fight with a, with a warfare that they have at that time. We don't know what it is. Now we have tanks and airplanes and these things. We don't know what sort of weaponry they would have at that time. Yeah. Okay, any brothers? Yeah, can you pass the mic to Sir first? Um, As-salamu alaykum. Yeah, 
Sheikh, uh, obviously there was no Turkey at that time. Can you just explain what did they call Turkey or how do you recognize the place to be Turkey today? They, they call it uh, Ard Turk. And of course then they talk about Rum, which talks about the West and, and Europe. They call all these areas Rum. And the Turkey, of course, was called Ard Turk. Okay, any sisters? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, you know this narration, how reliable is it? Which narration? The one that we've just gone through. All these, all these different events. You know? N- yeah, this account. The accounts of the imaginable course of events. Mm. This is not one tradition, these are tens of traditions that which are put together. Mm-hmm. As I said, you cannot rely on it, it's just something which we can infer from these different traditions. There are lots of contradictions, there are lots of anachronism between them and therefore we, what we have to do, we have to try to work out uh, a, a sort of more reasonable and imaginable course of event. Therefore, do not take this for granted. When the Imam comes, I'm not responsible. If you take another course of event, I'm not responsible, I'll take you. No, the reason I ask is because it gives like such detail of what's going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's like much more detailed than this. I mean, really? this is just a gist of it. There are very detailed. Names are there, numbers are there, names of villages are there. So, I have just... But things like where, like when it says that the Imam's going to flee, even if the name of the mountain is going to be in, so when all this happens and everyone's, you know, this kind of an, an account is accessible to everyone, won't it just give away like where he is and, you know, when people are looking for him when he's in hiding? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. What's the question? You know in the account, for example, it says that when the Imam flees in the He hides somewhere. It's, it even gives the name of the mountain where he's going to hide. Oh, so if a narration like this is accessible to everyone, or, or an account like this is accessible to everyone, won't everyone know where he is when he actually does go Well, I think probably in Zitawa. Again, the traditions are very vague, and uh, apart from that, Zitawa is a big place. I mean, three people can hide there very easily without being found for several weeks. And this is what will happen. Yes. Sheikh, is there anything to, number one, it's a quick one, is uh, anything around time frame of how long these events will take? And number two, can you just elaborate um, if there's anything that says why Kufa will be the center? Is it because Imam Ali was once the governor there? Or if I remember correctly, uh, because Imam, during Imam Hussein's time, the people of Kufa perhaps turned away from Imam? Mm. So can you perhaps elaborate on why? Well, those people at that time are quite different from the people at the time of Imam Hussein, certainly. So they are not the same people of Kufa. Why he establishes his center there, we don't know. I mean, it must be for some strategic reason. Not because, of course, it was a seat of Amir al or something like that. And Amir al chose Kufa for strategic reasons. Because he wanted to attack Sham and he wanted to protect his lands from the attack of uh, uh, the troops from Syria and therefore Kufa was the best place for him as the center of his government. It should be for some strategic reasons which we are not aware of. Uh, just a minute, before we come to brothers and sisters, any sisters? Yeah, thank you, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, sir. Um, how will people know that that is Prophet Isa when he comes? Yeah, th- that's what I said. He has to be very convincing. He has to say things which uh, would resonate with Christians. And he should have miracles with him, proving that he's Isa. Of course, for Muslims, the Mahdi would testify that this is Jesus. However, for Christians, he has to say things which would convince them. We don't know how he would convince them. Okay. Uh, in terms of the numbers of followers for the Imam, uh, it mentions 313. Does that mean that there might be some Sunnis in there? Because you said that it could be a wide... That's the first question. The second is, it also says that until such time he has 10,000 then he will advance. So, 
Maybe we have a better chance there rather than 313. We have a better what there? Better sir? chance of joining. Oh. <laughs> because the 300. Thank you. Good. <laughs> yeah. Because the 300 presumably is the 313 would be the core or his clients. Yeah. Of course. Would. After then, ten, after that, 10,000 there will be millions. There will be millions of uh, them. I mean, the army that he sends to Al Quds are hundreds of thousands. So that 10,000 is when he moves from Mecca to Medina. But when he establishes the state, when he makes the alliance with other parts of the Muslim world like Yemen, like Iran, then of course there will be millions of people who will help him. That there is a bigger chance there as well, I mean, for us to join the Imam alayhi salam. However, uh, uh, the, as I said, the 313, whether they could be Sunnis or not, they have to believe in Walaya of Imam, certainly. Maybe, we don't know. Nothing is said about that. No, nothing I have seen about that, that uh, whether they are Sunnis or Shias, or, it's always presumed that they are Shias. But there might be, we don't. Any sisters before we come to brothers? Yeah. Do we have any more information on the 50 women that will be amongst the 313? They are very honorable women. <laughs> no, we don't know. But is there any more detail about who, what, what kind of people they'll be or what part they'll play? Uh, maybe there might be some traditions. I, I, I did not really investigate about the details on these 313. In Bahar al-Anwar, he actually mentions in details the number which come from any area, like from Europe, from Africa, from other parts. He mentions the numbers. However, they are not reliable very much to, to rely on and uh, say that these are... But these are the people who are absolutely absorbed in Walayatullah. They don't, they don't live like other people in this world. They don't see things like other people in this world. Their, their mindset is completely tuned to the mind of Imam and to the heart of Imam and That's why as soon as he talks to them, they believe. It's not that they, they want a miracle or something. As soon as Imam speaks, it resonates with their hearts and with their mind because they have lived that type of life themselves. And they know who the Imam is. And uh, this is the most important uh, quality of these people, certainly. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a quick question. In what context were these hadiths narrated uh, about these details of the course of events? Were they just questions by these companions or... Well, some of them are questions, some of them are when the Shias were completely disappointed and then the Imams start to talk about these things, that don't worry, this day will come, these things will happen and then when the Imams talked about it, it created questions and questions were raised and the Imams elaborated on it. Secondly, uh, can you just explain who this Sheikh Ali Qurani is? Uh, is it Sheikh Ali Qurani is a, a respectful uh, 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 scholar in Qom. And uh, he is the one who has created this Ahlul Bayt digital library and uh, uh, many other internets and uh, uh, computer uh, digitalized CDs and these things in Qom. Uh, a very respectful scholar. Thank you. Any sisters? Yeah, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Would the 313 people be the people of the future or would the past people who are very good may be part of the 313? No, these 313 are the people of the future. Okay. Then the issue of Raja is a different thing. If we have time, we talk about it. That's a completely different issue. These are the people of that time. Thank you. Okay, Arias. Salam, Sheikh. Thank you very much for your lecture. Sheikh, when we've discussed the traditions just now, we've been very clear and we can actually visualize the role of the West um, in, in all these, and it's a substantial role. So, is that how 
the traditions are? They, uh, are they very specific about the role of the West? Or of course, they, they talk about the room, as we have in the Quran, Bolebat room. Now, room were actually uh, a place above Turkey. And therefore, we don't know what sort of states these traditions are talking about. That's why we just call the West. But the good thing about the whole issue is that although the confrontation between Islam and the West will become very imminent and close, how it never takes place, especially after Jesus salam, descends, then the whole uh, dispute will be resolved, and there will be no confrontation between Islam and the West at that time. The only other possible interpretation, possibly, is that you know, it, it refers to the Byzantine Church or the Roman Catholic Church, and could it be about a clash of religions rather than a clash of civilization? Clash of religion? Uh, well, if that was the case, they would have talked about Nasara and the Yahud. We have talks about Nasara and Yahud. But when it talks about regions, I don't think it's talking about religions. It's possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Assistant, you want to take the last question? Anybody from the brother's side? Yeah, I can pass the mic. This is the last one. Yeah. Uh, you were mentioned about um, the Injil and Torah in, the, in a cave in Antioch. Is there any significance that these two would be together in a chest? Is there a conspiracy in this sense? Ah, uh, don't know. <laughs> we have to wait and see. Of course, uh, uh, conspiracy on the part of Imam, you mean? Or, or? Conspiracy about someone like a Da Vinci Code or someone who maybe does no, not because want the, the Imam approves the text. That's a very important thing, because the Imam knows what the Torah and Injil is, so he approves the text. And therefore there is no hesitation about the authenticity and originality of these two books that they find there. Okay, thank you very much indeed. It's okay. okay. now next Tuesday, inshallah. Inshallah next Tuesday. Uh, Assalamu If I just may take the liberty, Sheikh, before we finish, uh, two points here. One was about that the Ahl Sunnah also believe in the 12th Imam but they don't believe in his ghaibat. Yeah. They believe that he's going to be born. And that ties in with uh, Hamid's question about uh, the Hela Sunnah being amongst the followers mm. and the, the supporters. Mm. Uh, one. Secondly, the point about Antioch, is it the same place where um, the people of the cave are? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have traditions right. that when they pass through Antioch, the people of the cave would rise and uh, will accompany the army actually. They become among the companions of the Imam. However, since in the in the Qista to Ashab al Kahf, I have uh, decided that the cave should be in Jordan, I just forgot about these traditions. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, a couple of uh, points here. One is uh, we're having these different days of um, the week when we're having our classes. Inshallah, the next class is on the 7th of July, which is the Tuesday. Thereafter, it is Friday, which is the last class, and that is the 17th of July. So, Inshallah, we will finish our module then. 